Hi, I'm Paul Haggis, director of Third Person, which opens here in Chicago June 27th. Thanks to Red Eye for the interview and look forward to seeing you. Something you've said a few times that I find very interesting is that you're only happy if you're miserable when <laughs> working on something. It's kind of true. And unless I, something really challenges me, unless I'm, I'm really working out through questions that I, I, I don't have the answers to. So I was hoping you could go back and look at the movies that you've written and or directed and rank which ones made you the most to least miserable when you're working on them. Gosh, I get miserable in every project. <laughs> um, I mean, Crash was a tough one because... Uh, you know, I knew that I was going to present, you know, as a writer, it was a real challenge because I, I, I knew I was going to present stereotypes in the beginning. And, but and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to say, okay, uh, uh, I'm going to present, you're in the, you're in the dark theater. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to reinforce every stereotype you've ever thought of of anybody and say, it's okay, shh, shh, shh. I know you're a big liberal. <laughs> Sit back, relax. Hispanics fail to park their cars on the lawn, right? You know, and, and Asians don't know how to drive and reinforce all these horrible things that, that, that you know, somewhere in the back of my mind we think. And, and, but as soon as I was able to do that and make you comfortable, it wasn't going to challenge you. Then I could start twisting you around in your seat and make these, these characters contradict everything. And so that's what I tried to do with that. So that was a, that made me uncomfortable, knowing that it could be misunderstood. I, I had nightmares about that. Um, Million Dollar Baby, you know, you've talked about a movie that's uh, about girl boxing and euthanasia. So well, well, if, if any, <laughs> I don't think any audience would come to see that. Thank God Clint Eastwood stepped up to direct that and did a marvelous job. In the Valley of Ella, uh, it was Tommy Lee Jones, Charlize Theron, but it was a, a movie about the war, and we were just a few years into the war at that time, and we just started when I started writing it, and I knew that America didn't want to see this movie. I, didn't, I knew they didn't want to be challenged about these things. Even liberals at that point were really supporting the war, and uh, and, and I said it was going to be impossible for me to to get uh, Americans to empathize uh, with with the Iraqis. I, I don't think they'll ever do that, but maybe, maybe they can empathize with their own men, women, the, the soldiers that are going over there trying to be heroes, doing the best they can and, and seeing what happens to them. And so that was, that was going to be a, a challenge, I knew. And, the, and then in the next three days, which I, I did with uh, Russell Crowe, again, uh, I'd never done that kind of form before. I, I loved, I really loved exploring a character in the middle of I guess a suspense thriller or a caper or whatever kind of f uh, film that is, and get crawling inside that guy's mind and asking questions. What would you do for love? How far would you go? Can you also rank a lot of these movies, not exactly super happy experiences for the audience either, <laughs> rank those movies in terms of the misery of the viewer? Oh, I don't know. I can do that. I remember after I wrote uh, Million Dollar Baby, I remember my... Uh, uh, my uh, wife at the time said, she wouldn't speak to me for a week. She just she said, you have to change the ending. I said, I can't. And then a week later, she went, yeah, yeah of course you can't. It's, it's, so, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I do love torturing people. But, but this one, I wanted to both celebrate love and, you know, ask some really hard questions about it and about, uh, you know, how you get what you want in a relationship or how you are doomed to fail. Uh, and so I got, was lucky enough to explore that in three different stories here and also explore uh, the nature of creativity. Uh, as writers, we're, we're incredibly selfish. We, we, you know, oh, and I was from the beginning of my career to the end. We, uh, it's any career, you, you dedicate, in order to be successful, you dedicate so much time to it. And other people often pay the price for that selfishness. Um, and of course, if you're living with a writer, you'll, you, you might find yourself on screen or in, in, at, at some time or other. So I, uh, I wanted to explore some of the questions that, that, that troubled me about being a writer and how we use the people around us. Well, I like that in that creativity, it seems like you sort of enjoy doing things that you think people might not be comfortable with or yes. they might not like. I'm kind of waiting for you to make your movie Justin Bieber National Treasure. <laughs> you might wait for a while. Yes. <laughs> well, that would be something that people would find challenging. Yeah, they true. might not like it at first. It's true. <laughs> okay, we can give that serious thought. Uh, well, what, what do you feel like you don't understand about relationships? Why, why did oh, you have to do this? Oh, so many things. I mean, uh, and some of the questions I posed in this is, okay, you get some, I mean, how do you love an impossible person? I'm an impossible person, and I've been in love with some impossible people. And, uh, and what do you do? I mean, if they change for you, if they're willing to open up and be vulnerable and, 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 and really trust you, do you just automatically betray them? 
Is that just part of the game? Is it? Is it all? Is, is why? Why game? would that be? Because part love of the is game. a game. Just getting them sometimes. Just you know, you go find someone who won't love you, who has all this armor, etc. If I can get under that armor, if I can get through the, those those defenses, maybe maybe I'll be I'm, I'm worth something. It reflects on us. And then once you get it, do you want it? And you know, once the game is finished, and that's I mean it's a very cynical view. But that's one. The other one was a much more romantic view. If you decide to trust someone who's totally untrustworthy, you know, if you start to believe in someone who doesn't even believe in themselves, you know, does love itself, you know, change them? Is love transformative? And yeah, I, I, yeah, you've you've talked a lot about that, and I found it interesting because I was. This is certainly not in the context of love, but I was imagining myself going up, like going to a dangerous neighborhood, going yes. to someone I should not trust. I mean, yeah. like, look. I know that I shouldn't trust you. Exactly. We've never met before. And you have happens. a gun. Yeah. Like, and be like, can you rise to my challenge? I think yeah. you'd be like, uh, no, I'm going to shoot you. It's, you know, but the braver you are in the love, in love usually the more it pays off. You know, and the more you try to protect yourself, the more likely you are to lose. And, uh, and, and the, the more you try to change the other. I mean, the, the, the third story is, a, is about a, you know, the James Franco and, and um, uh, Mila Kunis story is a, a man who just knows his wife has done something and he's trying to get her to look at it trying to force her to face her own demons and and, and if you if you do that if you, if you hold up a mirror to somebody and say look, look this is you look at this come on look at this face this who's reflected in that mirror you or them you know who, who who's you know, and does that work does does damning someone actually work or does it, or, or are, are you doomed to lose in that sure james franco said that he was willing to play anyone in this movie how <laughs> tempted were you to assign him the Olivia Wilde role. <laughs> Luckily, Olivia was already in that. So, no, as I send the script, and uh, this is early in the process, and uh, I just cast Liam and Olivia, and I sent her the script because I love working with actors over and again. I loved working with James. He did a very small role for me uh, in, uh, in the Valley Vela, and it was, it was wonderful. And so I sent her that, and I said, uh, he said, yes. I said, which role? He said, I don't care, man, you pick. And I said, how about the artist? He said, great. Uh, he just he loves you know digging in and, and he did. you didn't let him know that had the timing been different he could have run down a hallway naked <laughs> that would be fun having him run down a hallway naked wasn't it wasn't was she, wasn't she charming in that scene what's not to like yeah no but she is but it's not it, 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 you everyone thinks oh my god you get a, a nude scene is going to be a, 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 well since just, it's usually Liam Neeson trying to get a kid back I thought maybe you were trying to switch the casting <laughs> deliberately no it didn't it seems like you are someone who would rather someone hate your movie as opposed to just kind of shrug it off well um, yeah but I mean, what's interesting to me is that you've both said that you you want to challenge people and that you want almost want that love hate dynamic but you've also said you're worried people won't understand this and that they won't like it where how do you reconcile those same, two statements that was the same with crash no you I mean you have to be brave to, you have to do so this was a, this is a i mean i was really influenced by the the filmmakers of the 60s and 70s you know the godard truffaut Antonioni, and look at Antonioni's Blow Up, which is a film I loved. It's, 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 it starts out as a murder mystery, that's what you believe it is. Three quarters of the way through, he says, oh, oh, we're gonna have no answer to this ever. There is no answer to this, to this, this, this crime. And by the way, the movie's gonna end in a, a tennis game between uh, mimes. And that's supposed to mean something. And you walk out of that theater going, what, what, what did I see? What, what did it mean? And it sticks with you. And, and you, 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 I love those films where you go outside and, or you go to a bar or a restaurant afterwards and you argue with your friends. This thing. So this is a movie that you should bring at least three friends to. It's, like, it's not a date movie, it's a double date movie. How much of a success would you consider it if you released a movie that 80% of people hated? Uh, if I loved it, I wouldn't care. Um, we look at no, I'm I'm not Hitchcock. We look at look at Vertigo. Vertigo came out, and uh, the critics panned it, and the audience ignored it, and it was released. It was it was, it was removed uh, for like 20 years. We couldn't see that movie because he was so disappointed. It is. We all believe now that it was his finest film. So sometimes films just don't hit at the time. Sometimes you know you, you it, it takes a while. Uh, sometimes they're just stinkers. <laughs> so, but uh, no, I, I I don't. Obviously, everybody wants to be universally loved. Who doesn't? But uh, you have to be true to what you're trying to do, and that's, that's what I've been doing here. Speaking of that scene of Olivia running through the hotel yeah. naked, how many takes did you have to do for that? Uh, you know, she was, she was fabulous, because you know, what, if, if you approach something like that uh, and, 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 and you're really nervous, then the crew is nervous around you, and, and, it's, and, and you're not going to get... And this is, a, 
this is a, a, a wonderful and romantic and, and comedic scene. Uh, and she approached it that way. I think she said something about she was standing there naked eating pieces of pizza that were passed out around the set. Uh, of course, I sealed the set. I, of course, I, I was respectful of that. And it was just you didn't go out on the street with a megaphone. <laughs> Everyone, a can I hear that naked. Gen? But she stood there all the time. She's, she's standing buck naked in front of him, and and and, and she's you know, running, and and uh, she just she was fabulous to work with that way. You didn't want to have her eating pizza in the scene while she was running. <laughs> that would have been fun too. Is it disappointing that racism did not end after Crash came out? <laughs> it's very funny because uh, a lot of criticism I got at the time. In fact, I remember the Hollywood Reporter said something like, "You know, oh, please, this is an old story. I, I mean, if this had been released ten years ago, we'd call it brave or something." But we don't have these problems anymore. While I was reading that, there was a race riot at the Santa Monica High School. As liberals. We love to think we've solved all the problems because we're good people. And here I was calling the, 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 the basic conceit of Crash is that it's liberals who have to really look at themselves. It's people like myself uh, who, uh, whose pride tells them that you know, we're good people. Those are the people you should watch out for. It's not the obvious feelings in life that you should be careful of. It's, it's, it's the ones who, uh, who think they have everything worked out. So who, who do you think was more upset about that movie than liberals or conservatives? I think liberals hate it more. Was that, was that a surprise to you? No, because that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to point the finger at me. You know, that's all those characters are, are doing things that, that I have felt, or maybe haven't felt, but, but can imagine feeling. And uh, no, I, I, I try to challenge myself. I don't try to challenge the audience. I try to challenge myself. And here, you know, I, I wanted to say, okay, I'm not sure it's a good movie, but I think it's going to be a good social experiment. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to fuck with you here. <laughs> that I was going to present, you know, as a writer it was a real challenge because I, I, I knew I was going to present stereotypes in the beginning, and, but that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to say, okay, uh, uh, I'm going to present, you're in the, you're in the dark theater, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to reinforce every stereotype you've ever thought of. And look forward to seeing you. Something you've said a few times that I find very interesting is that you're only happy if you're miserable when working <laughs> on something. It's kind of true. Unless I, something really challenges me, unless I'm, I'm really working out through questions that I, I, I don't have the answers to. So I was hoping you could go back and look at the movies that you've written and or directed and rank which ones made you the most to least miserable when you're working on them. Gosh, I get miserable in every project. <laughs> um, I mean, Crash was a tough one because, uh, you know, I knew anybody and say, it's okay, shh, shh, I know you're a big liberal. <laughs> Sit back, relax. Hispanics fail to park their cars on the lawn, right? You know, and, and Asians don't know how to drive and reinforce all these horrible things to, that, that, you know, somewhere in the back of what we think. And, and, but Hi, I'm Paul Haggis, director of Third Person, which opens here in Chicago June 27th. Thanks to Red Eye for the interview and 